You again? I assumed after last week's absolutely dismal viewer retention rates no one would return. Yet here you are to keep me company. Listen to my words, just like our dear friend Izzy. Oh yes, if you're here you know much about her. And me. And for the rest of you, I only have three things to say. Erka. 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 Welcome back to the read-along of Adam Neville's The Vessel. Hope you're enjoying it so far. This is episode two. We're going to be covering chapters 15 through 27. So what are my initial thoughts so far without getting too far into it just yet because we are going to dive deep as usual. Well, some predictions came true. I don't quite know if Izzy is going to be a quote-unquote vessel because a vessel is mentioned, in fact, by word in this section of the of the read-along. But we find that Izzy and Flo are getting very, very close, and she uh, appears to be even taking the place of her, her long-deceased daughter. But well, we don't quite know exactly how that's going to completely manifest yet. We're only two-thirds of the way through the book, but uh, some things are definitely illuminated. So without further ado, let us begin with... Chapter 15. Now I'm going to cut off some of the screen here. Um, somebody uh, on the Discord said, hey, you totally shouldn't show all the text to not get a copyright strike. So maybe this will be a nice compromise. Uh, most of it will be here, not all of it, just in case Adam Neville's lawyers come um, sniffing around. But anyway, chapter 15. As ever, Flo's roomy eyes are glazed yet enthralled with what lies either beyond the open French windows or within her dwindling minds. She's still infatuated with this gar garden. Some stuff happens in the garden. There's some dream sequences. Uh, so I, I can't wait to find out exactly what this all means. But Jess notices her daughter's passage toward the wheelchair, and she extends an arm, preventing Izzy from getting too close. Izzy's immediately drawn to Flo. Flo is drawn to Izzy. And we know that Flo begins to actually start speaking. Not She isn't so angry anymore. So abrasive. But more than that, we see Flo's face has been transformed by a smile. And this is no ordinary smile. It is one of intense joy. The old woman's milky eyes have even moistened as she stares in wonder at and adoration at Izzy. So this is when she's finally making that, that connection, right? She's, she's imagining her daughter, at least I can only assume, because she's uh, wearing some of her clothes later in this, in this section. But Izzy also remains entranced by Flo, and while Jess's back is briefly turned, the little girl shuffles closer to Flo and accepts an, the extended lumpy fingers. Your nails are long. But Jess continues to stare in disbelief at the sight of her daughter and Flo, who not only smile at each other like two children at a birthday party, but are now holding hands. And then Izzy follows up with, I want to go into the garden, Izzy says, though she may have been sharing her intention with either of the adults in the room. And Flo stares at Izzy racing around the lawn as if she's watching a miracle from heaven unfold before her age dies, Jess stares at her sore cuticles and bitten down nails. Jess doesn't like this one bit, but we do know later on, Jess kind of warms up to the idea a little bit, or at least tests the waters. We'll talk about waters later. Which brings us to chapter 16. From the lane before the vicarage, any regular observer would notice how proud Nertha's house seems to have awoken and how it now appears to smile, though grimly, in a line of lit windows at the front ground floor. So there's some personification that happens multiple times. In fact, toward the end of this uh, grouping of chapters, we get another image, a personified image of this house. Jess continues uh, going around the house, doing her work, uh, ch changing out light bulbs and the vicarage's ground floor. Uh, but Izzy continues to go closer to Flo. And she says, don't get no closer, Iz. And she says, I won't. But after refreshing the first bulb on the landing, Jess steps down from the ladder to better see the curious line drawing that she glanced at yesterday. This is this gets cooler. I, I, I'm digging this aspect of the story, and I'm curious. I mean, there's definitely uh, some parts that are illuminating, right? Illuminating what this drawing means and where it's going to lead, but nothing quite yet. Hopefully in the final third, hopefully it, it all comes together. Along a straight track, a wooden cart is pulled toward the water by a hunched and disheveled beggar with one hand. The other extremity ends in a dark, gruesome stump. Now that more of the illustration is exposed, she can see also that the subject's figures, the subject abject figure's head is turned, an appalling face with a black, empty eye socket is revealed. And the tatty figure 
is blind and has been tasked with towing the large sphere inside the cart, a vessel that appears to have been constructed intricately with hawthorn sticks. A naked woman follows the cart, holding a scythe. So we've seen the scythe, and uh, we will learn of this um, this hawthorn spherical vessel thing as well later on. At the furthest edge of the pond's dark surface rises a suggestion of a third figure, but this one is too long and too thin to be human and appears as a black silhouette more than a fully rendered form, and it partially blends into the surrounding trees and stands knee-deep in the murky water into where the moonlight shafts from on high, it extends two spindly arms, the limbs fashioned from sticks, and a human female shape is also suggested by the body of the thing in the pool, though the height of the form would be several times that of a woman. And then Jess uh, reads some script at the very bottom of the picture, and it reads, Mother, Creator, Destroyer. I wonder what that means. And she pulls a face and turns away only to have her vision snag upon the rusted scythe that we've seen already, wall mounted across the landing. And averting her eyes, she shakes loose the keys on the old brass wing shaped like the sun. And she tries the key in the lock of the closed bedroom door next to Flo's master bedroom. No good. But the third key actually delivers a satisfying clunk. And what does she see? Well, it opens a room, uh, ready to step into an old photograph more than a dim brownish room. The, The furniture and every item upon the wall and shelves and bookcases remain in a pristine arrangement. She goes around um, unscrewing the dead light bulbs and the refreshed ceiling light shines on a veritable time capsule of a girl's bedroom perfectly preserved from the 1970s. We find out this girl is Charlotte Gardner. Your little girl. Flo's little girl. And then Jess, she goes back and uh, starts observing Flo and Izzy again. So Izzy now kneels before the footplates of Flo's wheelchair within easy reach of those old hands, still so capable of swiping fast. Head down, Izzy sketches furiously while nodding her head as if receiving instructions. Before Flo's eager face, Izzy briefly pauses her sketching to draw a small imaginary, imaginary circle in the air. Like that? No. Even bigger. So Izzy fashions a much bigger circle. Before her face with her fingers together in perfect synchronicity, Flo and Izzy crisscross the air wheel with spokes. We know we've seen a wheel with spokes giggling. Once the action is complete, gently flows, then extends one withered hand and touches the graze on Izzy's face. Okay, this is my prediction. I predicted it in the last video. And uh, Izzy says, mean girls done it. And those mean girls get their just desserts. So that brings us to chapter 17. And we're back to seeing Silent Moreau's flow. Illuminated by silver moonlight, her small form a crease in the middle of the vast bed, the tiny head propped up amidst plump pillows, her craggy face turned to the windows, eyes still pining for the garden. And cowering inside a sleeping bag laid on top of the vintage bed in Charlotte Gardner's room, Izzy's wide eyes peer out over the head of the bamboo, the panda that she clutches beneath her chin. And she doesn't like it here, and she wants to sleep with Mummy and Flo. And her mother consoles her, but she continues with their shapes, and she hears moving. It's kind of funny because this is a creepy old house. Uh, there's an, a creepy illustration. Uh, Jess finds the room of, of of Charlotte, right? And what does she do? She puts her daughter in there. Seems a little weird. I mean, I, I'm not expecting Jess at this point to believe in, in, in supernatural events or anything like that, but Still, it's kind of a creepy room to throw your kid in something that you just discovered. But anyway, Izzy's latest picture features these girls with red faces running in the foreground of what appears to be a wood. Their mouths are wide and howling. Their arms claw for safety. Behind them, a thin form like a stretched person rises tall. A starved thing, inked black, with a water bird's beak stabbing outwards from a slender head. The creature's feet are concealed by the circular body of water, maybe a pond from which it emerges. Above the scene, another circle forms a halo as bright as the sun. And while the two ladies sleep, Jess, uh, she tries some more keys, and she finds another room. She finds the walls are filled with photographs and detailed line drawings of RAF, RAF aircraft from the Second World War to the jets of the 1970s. There's a butterfly collection and a library of well-looked-after books and annuals from a younger world are coated with dust, though lightly. And upon the desk, a photograph features the boy from the family portraits in Flo's room. So not just the daughter, we have the son. And his name is Philip Gardner. In 1978, that's the year of my birth, so it was cool to see that (laughs) for some stupid reason. And then carefully opening the top drawer of the dresser in Flo's room, just as eyes immediately find two transparent sachets containing locks of hair, blonde and black. They are dated Charlotte, 1972. Philip. 
1972, and the stacked wall lots of photographs from a dais beneath the sachets of hair. And she continues to uh, rummage around the, into these photographs, and she finds this one that has a sun-blanched picture of the tones of diluted orange that features a group of women of varying ages, half a dozen, some elderly, who are seated on blankets around a pond in a wooden grove. So this is reminiscent. This is kind of what I was worried about with this book is it's a little too predictable. I, again, I, I don't have everything figured out, but um, there's one thing I predicted, and then all of these creepy old women that are showing up in the neighborhood, it appears as if they're part of some kind of ritual. I'm not quite sure yet, but I'd say that's the one downside is I was hoping that these things that were, were, were popping into my head, this imagery and these explanations for what we were reading, were going to be not exactly what I expected. I can't say they are 100% yet, but... Uh, Right now, it seems to be going in that direction. And as a group, they repeatedly appear arranged in a rough and formal ring on the lawn in which they partake of a kind of sisterly celebration. And there is some form of wheel or wreath from the sticks entwined with bright flowers and several other photographs. A kind of dome rises in the background, half a sphere woven out of hawthorn. Well, we've seen something like this very familiar in the drawing. Uh, but the wheel and the cod creel of the subtle pagan touch to the enigmatic gatherings. And in each ensemble, the only woman per permanently without a smile or a sun-brown face, who rears proud but pale and unhappy at the side of the gatherings is Flo. So why is Flo unhappy? We know she's unhappy in the present, with the exception of when she's with Izzy, who reminds her of her da daughter, Charlotte. But I'm wondering back then, what happened to Flo? Um, I'm excited to find out, and that's one thing that I honestly have no idea uh, where it's going to go. Let me know if you have a prediction in the comments below. And inside the room next to the door within the old bed, Izzy sleeps, her arms tightly hug her panda, her forehead glistens with sweat, and her lips work at unspoken words. Ooh, is she uh, repeating the mantra that Flo told her? But Flo sits up in bed, an emaciated figure, her thinning hair wild, she stares at the door as if alert to a summons, and begins a gentle rocking back and forth. And Jess frowns, stirs, and nearly rouses, but doesn't wake. She sinks away, Instead, into the much-needed rest, her face blank, near lifeless. But bound by fatigue, she is not alert to the rustle in the room that passes onto the landing, nor does she pay heed to the gentle bumps of someone who is on all fours outside the room and crawling through the dark. That's a pretty creepy image, and we find um, in her dream also that Flo is running around uh, in the garden, I believe, with Izzy on all fours. So there's some cool dreamlike sequences in, in, in this section of the book in particular. One about a, a man that, that, was, that was pretty um, shocking to me. I didn't, I didn't quite expect it. And I, I'm wondering how the man plays a part too. But Izzy runs out from the vicarage and performs a series of perfect cartwheels across the shorn grass and behind her, like an excitable dog scampering after its mistress, an old figure dress and a pale nightgown capers swiftly on all fours. Flow. And Izzy and Flo draw an identical but invisible wheel shape in the air in perfect synchronicity, their hands moving in an anti-clockwise direction. In the middle of their imaginary circles, they cross the spokes at exact same time and speed. Makes you wonder, what is this thing going to be about, right? This, this weird celebration. Uh, so we, we see that Flo is, is upset or, you know, not very happy anyway in these old photos while this celebration is going on, but she seems to be teaching Izzy this stuff, right? That, that seems to mimic what's what's happening uh, in the past, and but she's happy about it. I don't know if she thinks that she's going to bring her daughter back to life or maybe the death of her daughter had something to do with this celebration. Uh, hopefully we will find out very soon. But the faint piping rises through the scales and heralds the emergence of a large form surfacing from the water somewhere nearby but hidden inside the trees. Grinning, they both slowly rise from the earth and into thin air, lingering a few meters from the ground. There's a lot of levitation in this section, I forgot to mention, and this is where it begins. But then Jess wakes suddenly, her sleep broken by a distant, urgent, repetitive trill, a ringtone. Her phone is ringing somewhere in the distance of the vicarage, so she goes after it, uh, but beside her, Flo seeps peacefully, and she continues to chase after this ringing phone, heading downstairs, and the murk of the lower floor transforms Flo's detritus into ominously indistinct humps and heads and silhouettes. Everything appears marginally animated. That's one thing I hate about walking around in the dark, especially in a house, especially a house that's unfamiliar to you, like, like Jess is right here, is that your, your mind starts playing tricks. You start to see things, and I actually just watched a movie last night that I highly recommend that... Um, is very gritty, very grainy, uh, very dark, and you will see uh, many creepy things uh, that you both see and don't see. It's called Skinamarink. I dug it, highly recommend it. 
But moving on, the ringtone is definitely and inexplicably issuing from the midst of the landfill in this room. And she lowers herself to her hands and knees and peers into the black mouth of a tunnel fashioned into the disorder that is piled upon around the vast dining table. And she finds a post-it note. And it's stuck to a box and it reads, Manus Exite Materni. I'm sorry, my Latin. I'm assuming that's Latin. I had to look it up. I had to pause the video for a second. But it means, Ghost of my paternal ancestors be gone. I should have looked it up when I was uh, reading the book instead of just now because I think it would have provided much more context. But anyway, moving on. Uh, and from deep inside the tunnel, the screen of her phone is glowing green. So how did her phone get here? Ghosts? We, we remember some stuff being thrown around earlier on in the story. But there is the phone, and lit up by the screen is a strange circular arrangement of odd and unappealing objects. She sees the a spoked wheel made from sticks. Uh, she recognizes it. Of course she does. The pattern resembles the sundial of the stained glass above the front door. And a tiny sheaf of wheat, a rustic loaf of desiccated bread, several small wooden bowls. One bowl contains an oil, another powdered incense. So this, this burrow, this barrow of sorts, has all kinds of strange... Uh, ritualistic things that um, I'm, I'm sure things are going to come to a head anyway. But she calls it a grotesque, home, a grotesque homemade shrine. And then she decides to answer her phone, but the screen reads, call her unknown. She says, hello? But there's no answer, only silence. And just drops the phone down on all fours in the darkness. She bows her head over the dirty shrine. The confining walls press around her head, trapped by confusion and buried by fear. She doesn't understand what's happening. She's exhausted. And a flap, crack, flap. <laughs> There's a lot of strange um, uh, sound cues in this book. And from out of the darkness next to her face, a trapped bird explodes into terrified, frantic life. And just screams and clutches her face as it's beaten as it's beaten by a flurry of dusty rings. And she ducks, and this bird flies out of this thing. And well, we know what's going to happen with birds next. I believe there are pigeons, if I remember correctly. But the bird noisily rises from her head, the din of its wings bewildering her on, until it is free. And Jess, right before we end this chapter, she goes back to flow. She finds her, withered, smiling in her sleep. But nestled against her thin back is little Izzy, sleeping and clutching her panda. The connection deepens, which brings us to chapter 18. And like an evacuee awaiting embarkation, Jess fidgets in the hallway. She checks her watch twice without paying attention to what she reads. But when she looks down the hall and through the frame of the living room doorway, there is her daughter standing beside Flo's wheelchair. And there's whispers passing between them. But oblivious to her mother's request, because, you know, she's calling her over and saying, hey, you need to get, get over here right now. This is getting freaking weird. Izzy remains rooted beside Flo and continues to stare into the woman's murky eyes. We get another familiar scrape from the other side of the front door. A key angrily buries itself into the lock. And who is it? It is Morag, big burly Morag. She lumbers past Jess, and once she's ambled into the kitchen, she unleashes a weary sigh at being back again. And Jess tells her of all of the odd things that are going on, but Morag tells her to not be bloody stupid. Uh, but she does learn that Flo has a daughter and a son, which we already know about that, and her daughter died when she was little, Sheila said, and her son can't think much of Blossom, never been to visit, no letters, nothing. Can't say I'm surprised, but nothing to do with me or you. And this is the first appearance of Erka, 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 which I had to look up, of course. I was very curious what she was saying. And apparently, uh, this is according to Wikipedia, it's called the uh, Erkerbot, Old English for Field Remedy, is an Anglo-Saxon metrical charm recorded in the 11th century intended to remedy fields that yielded poorly. And in fact, the triple invocation Erka, Erka, Erka is compared to the Latin Sanctus, 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 and interpreted as derived from a vocative form of Erakanan, the true, genuine, or holy, or in a proper name, Erka, from an earlier Eorse, Eroke, I don't know, for a fertility, fertility goddess as mother of earth. So interesting stuff. I, I, I really like uh, folklore horror. I think it's one of my favorites because it, it allows you to go back in history, if you're a writer, of course, and find all these cool, weird, you know, just these mysterious old things and, and bring them into the present, right? It's, it's always a, a fun time and it's, it's kind of easy, right? If you're, if you're short on ideas, always go to the past because there's plenty of stuff out there. And then old Flo watches Izzy being tugged away and sends the girl on her way by shrieking another, Erica, 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 before and encoring with, gods cannot be contained inside walls, whatever that means. I mean, it sounds like she's talking about mother of earth, according to uh, good old Wikipedia. But Izzy says, 
Bye bye, Flo, she calls out as she leaves. And in the distance, Flo's head turns swiftly at Izzy's summons. She beams from her chair and waves a twisted hand before using it to trace a circle clockwise in the air. This she crosses with an invisible spokes. Merry meet. And just can only watch dumbfounded and a little hurt and anguish that only increases when Izzy fashions the same circle in the air and crosses it with spokes. Merry pot. So uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's a little bit of what we're learning about. their little their little whispers together, right? Their little conversations. But that brings us to chapter 19. And a dead bird, emaciated in gray, lies upon the shit-spattered cement floor of the abandoned utility room. This is where Izzy uh, unleashes her birds, right, <laughs> to all of these bullies. What I called, I totally called it. And into this distance recess of the primary school, little used. And only then for storage, Izzy and equally timid girl have retreated as far as they are able to. The three girls who ransacked Izzy's bag and stole her unicorn from the line blocking the only way out. Today their ranks are reinforced by two boys. So they brought uh, the big guns this time. And I think they're like trading cards or something. That's right, the trading cards. Some fall to litter the cement floor. The special edition card is tugged from the fingers of a friend. Izzy's cereal bar is plucked from her own hand. And uh, they're making fun of her being poor. That's another theme I wish was a little bit more uh, explored further in, in, in this book because I think it would have been nice linking that with the main plot somehow because later on in this in this section we'll we'll find um, uh, uh, Jess uh, you know touring touring this apartment she wants to live in to uh, take her her child away from the crappy place where she lives. But uh, then Izzy is pushed hard and falls on her backside. And these birds land between Izzy's spread ankles with a parched rattle. And behind the boy, the gangs bring back, horrified by the bird's corpse, yet more than able to shrink out of their mouths. A uh, thin sound, Aridia's eerie as those produced by a primitive pipes made of bone. And Izzy's hand s- slips inside the pocket of her cardigan and reappears clutching the small bone carvings the flow gave her that morning, ancient figurative art depicting a wheel or sun. And her lips move and begin to mumble so softly that no one in the room will ever hear what it is that the little girl encants, including us, unfortunately, I guess. Uh, but then the rattle of air moving quickly through the chink- chinks of the old outbuilding coincides with the bustle of suddenly alarmed birds in the rafters. And where so many birds now shriek and thrash, and the girl's face hitches with concern enough to prevent her from speaking or warning the others. But in, the, in her mother's dream, in that dim, grayish atmosphere, Izzy is dressed in her school uniform, and she walks across the vicarage lawn toward a wooded grove. Absolute silence grips the scene uh, from the trees, their drifts, and ethereal piping she's heard from her sleep and just is watching her daughter from behind the murky glass of the French windows, the Velcro straps that restrain her wrists and ankles, so she is trapped in this wheelchair. And then, of course, her desperation to call her daughter only succeeds in reopening her facial scar. And I, I appreciate that, right, because that's representative of the, the trauma she has endured from Tone, Tone, who just came out of prison, but then out on the lawn, Flo joins Izzy and stands beside her. But this is Flo when younger. Freed from a wheelchair, her back is straight, her posture erect. The elegant Flo from the photographs in the bureau takes the little girl's hand. And Izzy looks up at Flo adoringly as if at her mother. Together they turn their heads to the great and restless trees. And then a glimmer of a figure enters her peripheral vision. Someone dressed in a white nightgown seeps from the darkness and appears behind Jess's hand, head and shoulders. From the sleeves of the gown, a pair of emaciated forms extend, and two veiny hands settle upon her shoulders. It's Flo again, but a woman with arms ghastly and aged enough to have just assisted in her rise from among the dead. And then back into the present, pointing at the iron sky behind the dirty glass of the storm, Izzy mouths the word Erka, and the light dims until only the bright edges of glimmering plunge the broken death survive oblivion. And the room instantly fills with the intense swooping of the trapped, routed pigeons. They just come down. Passing birds scrape her face, her hair is raked out in the turbulence of so many frantic wings. Urine spatters her black shoes and white ankle socks. So this girl, this other girl, she pees her pants. But Izzy stands upright in the middle of the room, unaffected by anything that surprises herself. She stares at the bone wheel in her palm. The silence ends in the passing of a heartbeat. And into the old storeroom comes the bedlam of crying. These frightened girls. Jess wakes up. And then, of course, she gets a call. Izzy's school is calling on her phone. Which brings us to chapter 20. And the school gates fit for a high-security prison swing closed automatically, crashing and rattling within the frame. The shuddering gate passes a judder through the spiked fence, post-thrusting outward of the summit of the long barrier. And her mom picks her up. She's asking her what happens. And she said, it all just come like a dream. 
So she isn't necessarily in her right mind. Is 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 Flo using her as a puppet, or does she imbue her with these powers? I'm not quite sure. Or maybe just the spell was uh, dreamlike in a way. But Izzy's eyes well within tears, and her face crumples because, you know, her mom's upset with her. But Izzy counters with, you know, they keep hurting me every day, and Flo helped me, just like I predicted. Yes, uh, that she told me things to say to make it stop, and what things? Words. And just stands up. Her face now so drawn with sleep deprivation and stress, she can only gaze at Izzy as if her daughter is another mother's child. Ooh, I like the implications of that. I like the subtext of that. So it brings us to chapter 21 with a hand that is not incessantly pulling and a strand of her fringe. Jess holds her phone. And uh, Penny's there. Oh, Pen, love. Hiya. I'm, a, I'm after a big favor. Really sorry. Got problems up Izzy's school. Uh, but she is on a date, I believe, some kind of anniversary date. And Izzy interrupts, and we know where she wants to go. She wants to go to Flo's as she vocalizes, and she does not want to go to Penny's. Scene break, and then at the front door of the Nerthus house, it closes behind Morag on her way out. Waning sunlight pierces the stained glass of the spoked wheel fan light. This continual symbol. And she says, hello, hello, Flo. And Mary meet. Of course, we know these words already. Uh, their heads are close together than before, and Flo appears to be inspecting one of Izzy's drawings that she laid out on Flo's lap. So they are they are bonding. They are bonding very quickly. Uh, and she this is where we learn a little bit about Tony. So he's come out of prison and had to live in another flat. He's too angry, so he's got some anger problems. Sounds like he's you know obviously the one who caused uh, the scar on, on Jess's lip and. Maybe the, t- the teeth. I remember her talking about teeth in a sink, I think. But then Jess shows up. She approaches the pair, and they both appear irritated as she's intruding. Uh, and then she gives Flo these photographs, these three photographs in her hands, pictures taken from Flo's collection. And as he leaps up to collect them, and instantly a gape at their contents. Who are they? Thinks she's remembering her own little girl. She thinks you're her. This is what's kind of weird. I, I mean, I don't know. I... <sighs> I get later on that where it seems like she would come to the realization that Flo is really thinking that Izzy is her daughter. Right now, this this seems to be more like the audience uh, making a, a conjecture about what's going to happen. This threw me off a little bit. But Flo's, light, Flo's face lights up with the eagerness to see what Izzy has given her. It's a color picture of the celebration. And she asks what they're doing. And Flo whispers, exalted. Her face is animated, though. Not sad like it was uh, we saw her earlier in the photo. Then Flo uh, drops the photographs and uh, Jess goes to bend the, bends over to pick them up. In a flash of movement as Flo swings her whole upper body behind her, swiping below at her carousel head. Snap! But what happens? Hyper alert. Jess, Jess catches the old wrist in one hand, holds it firm in a fisted grip and whispers, Don't you fucking dare. So for old, so frail, so reduced. And she knows she's listening, even though she's playing uh, old <laughs> dementia flow. So this is where um, Jess finally asserts herself. She she becomes powerful. She's going to fight back against what Flo maybe is, is. I don't think we really know. Uh, she's starting to float around outside of her house a lot, coming up very soon. Uh, but this is when she's finally up. She's upset. She's done. She's done with Flo getting in between her and her daughter. Which brings us to chapter 22. And face stained and hair must just sips her hand inside the murky shade of the last light fitting on the ground floor inside the porch. She drops the exhausted blub, bulb, its glass of musty brown, into the bag at the foot of the collapsible steps, then slips the new bulb into the socket. She steps down and hits the switch inside the hallway. And then she passes by the living room. She peers inside the doorway and catches sight of Izzy in conference with Flo. Uh, Izzy sits before the wheelchair foot plates and looks up at Flo as if listening intently, though Flo's lips do not move. When Izzy resumes drawing on a sketch pad, Jess moves on, wearily shaking her head. So she still allows it for some strange reason. I guess nothing terrible has happened yet. So no reason to do so, even though she she knows something's going on, right? She's got to. She even said that she thought Flo was, um, you know, seeing her daughter in, in Izzy. But we are now at Proud Nerthus House at dusk. Across the road, those who watch the Vicarage's transformation see windows beaming golden. Not only has the grin from the ground level broadened, but the eyes are open and a light upstairs. A watcher may remark that after sleeping for so long, the building appears to have been aroused from within. So this is, like I was saying earlier, we're doing more personification. It's kind of a cool effect, looking at things from the outside. And, and now I can see um, really Neville using the omniscient voice to um, to its full advantage. And we see that definitely 
more as we go later on, because really it just gives you the opportunity to tell the reader us uh, about things or show us things that the characters aren't aware of. But then as another fl fresh bulb clicks into place inside the bathroom, the illumination of the first floor landing is further improved. Jess steps off the stool, relief manifests until she catches sight of a drawing of that ghastly blind beggar with one hand forever pulling a cart through a night blackened wood. This was kind of cool for effect too. I like this. In the corner of her eye, the rusty scythe on the wall glimmers dully, just turns her back on it all. And we get some kind of sounds in here. So plates and pans drip suds on a draining rack. Two rubbish sacks bulge open on, upon the floor. The washing machine thrums, spins its drum. Outside, the sky bruises at the concussion of night. I really like that because in horror movies, a lot of times you'll, you'll see somebody, they'll notice something, uh, and there'll be that kind of moment, that pause where the camera's cutting in the around the room, trying to create uh, more atmosphere, right, with sound effects of these clearly mundane things. But it's it was done to cool effect here. I feel like he could have you know expanded upon it and, and reused it uh, more than he did here. And then Jess, she just says, "How does a grown woman make so much mess?" And then <laughs> Izzy comes back with, "Morag's a lazy bitch, Izzy." And Izzy runs a tap, hold, <laughs> holds Flo's drinking bottle under the stream. Flo's thirsty, and then, um, she, how do you know? She told me. Jess drops rubbing a cup ring and watches her daughter. Since you're such a good mate to Flo, you can help give her a bath. That's kind of weird. That's kind of weird, but um, it happens. It happens. It definitely happens. I'm not sure why um, she would invite uh, her daughter to bathe an old lady, but here we are. Chapter 23, hunched, wasted, naked, at her most frill, Flo sits perched upon a cushioned stool beside the old bathtub in a bathroom that has never been modernized. And, and Izzy is there right beside her, holding her hand. And what, is, what does she say? Erika, Erika, Erika. Flo is muttering that, smiling with delight and swishing her lumpy hands through the gently steaming water. But there is a uh, unusual object at the back of the dark space, and it catches her eye, a collection of sticks and a wooden bowl. And she digs deeper and finds out more, finds more stuff for sure. So Jess creates a shadowy gap in the wall of towels, bed limit, and nightwear, and reveals another small shrine, similar to the installation she discovered in the dining room tunnel the night before. And if Jess was to look around the open door of the closet and into the bathroom, she would see Flo's entire body gradually rise from the bathwater, at the very same time that she raises the parcels. So these things are interconnected. This again is 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 the use of, of omniscient. And I, I'm beginning to see how it can be beneficial for horror writing because a lot of times you wanna creep the reader out and sometimes you creep the reader out by taking the POV away from the character, right? You wanna show us something they can't see and that's exactly what he's doing right here, especially showing the the parallel of, of what's going on here. But only Izzy can see how much Flo has altered physically. The woman's aged face appears deranged and fearsome, yet somehow elated at the same time. And as Flo grins so horribly, she reveals yellow teeth embedded in black gums. But Jess unwraps his parcel in hair clippings, a man's cufflinks, and a pair of desiccated shrivel lumps about the same size as human eyes or testicles. Uh, lie inside the stiff wrapper, but she's disgusted and she drops it. But because she's distracted, she hasn't seen the unnatural movements of her patient and pushes the cupboard door fully closed until she hears a click. And then Flo returns back into the water, which brings us to chapter 24. Wearing a fresh dying gown, the white cotton pattern with yellow flowers, and her hair newly brushed and neat, Flo sits up in her bed. Once more, she's silent and her expression is dour, and her eyes comb the darkened windows overlooking the garden. And there is Jess there. She's at the end of the cord hangs a white plastic oval. SOS is imprinted on the front of the necklace. So this is when uh, she basically puts a tracking device on, on Flo to see what's up. And some weird stuff happens. This is when stuff starts getting really weird. And hours later, Jess returns to the landing from the staircase and plots the master bedroom, a steaming cup of black coffee gripped in one hand. But she pauses outside the door of Charlotte Gardner's old bedroom and peeks in and Izzy is fast asleep and clutching bamboo her panda. She is just absolutely exhausted, so she falls asleep, of course, nods, lurches awake, but then again, every effort and attention. The next time her eyes close, they don't reopen. Slumped in the armchair, she sleeps and she dreams. And this is where uh, the creepy man shows up. This is what I was talking about earlier. Um, so let's let's dig in. Let's do this. So we are in the wood and from inside the copse, when standing beside the black pond in the grove, the vicarage Garden appears enchanted, a soft focus of pastel colors misted with pollen and made radiant by celestial light. 
soft notes from a woodwind instrument draw a naked figure out of the woods, a man who appears at the edge of the grove. This reminds me of the film Men, directed by Alex Garland, written to, I believe. Um, there's some weird nature stuff in that, and there's like a naked dude coming through nature. That is the image I got. If you haven't seen it, it's great in a weird way. Go check it out. But then between his legs, a loincloth of dark gore hangs from where his genitals have been crudely removed. Yikes. And he points his stump at the pond. But then Jess wakes up with a start in pants relief at having broken from the nightmare. The first thing she sees is Flo in her bed sleeping, but Jess is soon frowning. Why is it so light? She really cannot be morning. She just dozed off. The night couldn't have passed, so uh, sunlight pours around, and from behind her chair, a naked male body extends to the space behind Jess. He leans over her shoulder, and here he is, the man. My missing parts. And Jess turns her face, almost touches her horrid, bloodless flesh of a figure. Black chest hair, ransacked crotch, <laughs> bearded with crimson ruin. Interesting way to describe that. He speaks again. Have you seen them? They took things. Only then does Jess scream. So she wakes up again, right? She's, it's, is this, I'm guessing, a, a double dream effect like we see sometimes in uh, horror films? But clutching at her face, she peers between her spread fingers and observes the empty bed in the darkened room the bed of the elderly patient that she should have been watching. The screen indicates that Flo is 30 meters behind her. That would be outside in the garden. Up the garden. Yeah, so Flo is doing some weird levitation Spider-Man action outside right now. And bumping. Yes, there is also a bumping, but coming from somewhere within the house through, though not in this room, Charlotte's room. And she immediately thinks of Izzy, of course. But it's empty. And the sleeping bag forms an open mouth. So uh, I called that description out earlier. I'm not sure if it's a callback or if Mr. Neville likes to uh, refer to things like this, but uh, we remember the backpack when uh, all these kids, all these bullies were, were taking uh, stuff from, from Izzy that uh, it was described as a, a flopping open mouth. But her little girl's upended in a perfect handstand, her feet resting against the wall. At first I thought this was going to be kind of like the exorcist when she comes down the stairs, but um, it, didn't, it didn't end up being that way. And this is when we see uh, her wearing another girl's clothes, little Charlotte's clothes from the 70s. They must be. So this, to me, would have been a better realization of when uh, she either vocalized or, or, or accused people or even told Izzy that, you know, she thinks Flo is, uh, or she thinks that Flo thinks Izzy is her daughter. It's kind of a weird thing to just bring that up previously. I don't know. Maybe it didn't bother you a whole lot, but it just seemed a little bit too much like that's what I'm thinking as the watcher, not so much the character in the book. But anyway, small gripe, but Jess flees the room only pausing to short the, shut the bedroom behind her. Holding an unlit torch, which is a flashlight, even though they call it dousing a torch. Um, I, I think I read that right. Um, I know the British like to call flashlights torches, or I guess we call torches flashlights because, you know, they started the whole thing. But she's outside. The only movement out here is directly behind and above Jess's head, one story up, up there. Even though the in indistinct limbs of the climbers blended with the night, what appendages extend from the floral nightgown allow the frail figure to move sideways as deftly as a crab and as meticulously as a probing spider. So that's a pretty cool image. And this, again, is more um, demonstration of the omniscient POV. So we can, you know, the camera's almost looking behind Jess and seeing uh, flow skitter up the side of this uh, this um, this building or this this house but at a glance the handset becomes an appalled scrutiny that reveals a red dot signifying Flo has indeed returned to the bedroom so she mysteriously climbed back inside and we see izzy nestled against Flo's back smiling with her own deep sleep and curiosity overriding shock she gathers herself sufficiently to creep to the open window and to look down at the drop of the patio below she closes her eyes at the window which brings us to Chapter 25, the rain-speckled bus windows overlooks the gray smear that is the world. Sat in the window seat, Izzy's eyes flick across a landscape that increasingly urbanizes and darkens. Uh, mother upright, mums dozed off. And this is when we get uh, more glimpses of creepy, creepy flow in the distance, right? She glimpses a distant figure dressed in white, but Izzy smiles. She's not afraid. Why is it that kids are always not afraid in these things? I mean, I know she's kind of possessed, so maybe that's why, but... Uh, even in the movie I watched last night, Skin and Marink, uh, you, you'll, you, you're wondering why aren't these kids frightened as hell, you know? But I guess it couldn't uh, be a great movie if, if, if you had the kids just running and hiding the entire time. But the figure acquires more detail the harder she looks, and possibly Flo is there and dressed in her gown from the night before. 
and she's doing these, um, she's got her arms raised and her palms are upright and her feet are hover a sh short distance from the soil and the patchy weeds. So she's doing kind of like a, some David Blaine action right here. And then when Jesse's flown the distance frame between the two buildings, the elderly woman's spindly arms are drawing circles in the air. The aged face has tilted back and her mouth either gulps at the sky or cries for help. So something's going on. But Izzy has lowered her face and is now engrossed in inspecting the little unicorn that dangles from the strap of her rucksack. So she is back to herself. Which brings us to chapter 26. And for once, she's wearing something other than the green uniform that she throws on for work. Uh, so nonetheless, she hopes uh, this, will this transformation will bring her closer to becoming the legal tenant of this empty living room with its smart laminate floor floorboards and pristine magnolia walls and ceilings. So this is when she's in the apartment dreaming about this. She was looking at the brochure earlier on the book. And I'm, I'm glad there's scenes like this. I, I guess I just wish they were more tied to the plot rather than a separate, separate kind of event. It would have been interesting to see a, more of a connection there, but maybe there will be. Who knows? We'll, we'll see how it goes. But she's talking to the realtor um, and, and Izzy painfully says, is daddy coming too? But, you know, her mother says, nope, not now. Which brings us to chapter 27. And despite the effort she made with her appearance for the viewing, Jess is dead on her feet as she roots the reduced items of the supermarket shelf. Tony is outside. Again, he's using the omniscient voice to give us a glimpse of this creepy pale-faced man right here. A man stands on the other side of the store windows, pale of face, tense, a raincoat hood concealing his hair. He stares at Jess, his phone still held to his ear. Tony, Jess and Izzy, they don't see him. And uh, she wants to take this little toy home she finds. And uh, her mother says, nope, I got I to gotta have every penny I, I, I can find to, uh, to pay for this, this, this new life for us. But she's still crying. Izzy rises from the floor and races after her mom after she knocks this toy out of her hands. But Tony has vanished from the other side of the window. And they leave. And what happens? Old Tone. Tony, you devil. He uh, lowers himself to one knee and scoops his daughter up. And uh, what does he have? He's got the gift. He has exactly what she desired. The stowaway jumped in me pocket as I tried to leave the shop. And it is, in fact... The toy she wanted. And here he is trying to bring them all back together, doing his best, giving her money, even buying gifts. But, you know, it's not really having the best effect on Jess, of course. And she has a little chat with him right after this. But uh, he asks, you know, when is she going to come? And soon, Daddy, when you're not angry anymore, I'll be coming to see you every weekend. <laughs> and Tony, he keeps on with the uh, uh, turn in the dagger, even though I ain't always there is. Uh, what I never forget is how much I love you and your mom. You're the little girl we brought into this world together. Come on, Tony. You're pretty sappy. Me and your mom have to for you. Ooh, he twisted it even deeper. But he uh, takes it out. She, she's got a, Jessica's like, hey, I got to go talk to this guy. He's being a dick. Uh, but what does he do? He brings out a 50-pound note. Here, been a good week. And she recoil, recoils. And immediately she kind of, or at the beginning anyway, she kind of turns it away. But she ends up taking it which uh, finally brings us to Izzy looks at her father one last time, her little face stiffening with concern and sympathy for her thwarted father. But her dad isn't looking at her anymore. He's staring at the back of her mom's head instead, as if he's calling upon every last reserve to quell his temper. Only when he notices Izzy's scrutiny does his expression transform into a reassuring smile. He winks. Well, that brings us to the end of part two of Adam Neville's The Vessel. Let me know what you're thinking so far. I'm still liking it. Um, I was a little bit disappointed that some of my predictions came true. Uh, but, you know, I've seen a lot of horror movies. It seems that Neville is using a lot of common tropes, common setups, common traumas in the story. And that's okay. I'm not really bothered by it yet. But we're going to see how this entire thing resolves next week. Yes, we only have one more part. It's crazy. This is the shortest read-along I've ever done. Usually they're like six parts. But because... It's such a short novel, a novella, if you will. Uh, we're going to end it quick, so I'm excited to get through this. I'm excited to hear your thoughts, so put them down in the comments. Put them on the Discord. If you're not already there, join it. It's free to join. And I will see you in the final video next week, part three of The Vessel. So on that note, I guess I'll um, end this with the, uh, the fine words of Flo. Erka, erka, erka. See you next week.